Resistant starches are fascinating. They resist digestion. So you can actually use them to sort of manipulate carbohydrate absorption and ultimately have a massive effect on insulin resistance, but also even visceral fat and overall fat loss. So we'll just jump right into it. Quickly, what a resistant starch is, is it's a starch that's resistant to digestion through multiple different avenues, but it's resistant in the small intestine. So it doesn't break down in the small intestine, but it continues on to the large intestine where it can get fed on by bacteria, but you never actually absorb the carbohydrates from it, or you do in very small amounts. Now, what makes this happen is just the actual structure of the glucose molecules themselves. So if you have a resistant starch, the glucose, glucose molecules are tightly packed together in a particular fashion called uh, amylopectin. So it's a type of glucose bound together. So you, the enzymes just cannot penetrate. It cannot break it apart. They're like cemented together. Whereas like a normal starch, they're loosely packed. So the enzymes can get in there and break apart those bonds and you absorb the glucose. So how can we utilize resistant starch? We're gonna talk about different forms. We're gonna talk about all kinds of different things. We'll talk about how to use them. And I'll put timestamps so you can like jump to different places, but I recommend you understand the inner workings of this. If you don't mind, please drop a comment. It helps the videos out. It helps the algorithm. YouTube really likes that. So just drop a comment, maybe ask a question or just say thank you, whatever. And then also hit that subscribe button. So there's three different types of resistant starches. There's RS1, there's RS2, and there's RS3. We'll just give a quick kind of education here because it's very important. An RS1 starch is a resistant starch that does not digest or does not really break down because it mechanically cannot. It's so trapped in a plant cell wall that it actually just enzymes can't penetrate it. So it's really more about just the mechanical structure. So you're gonna see this with things like beans, like kidney beans are such a great example. People eat kidney beans, they just get terrible gas because they don't digest them, right? So the mechanical aspect of RS1 is really what's important. It's in a lot of like different plant foods. That one's not that cool to talk about. RS2, we get into an interesting category because RS2 resists digestion because of a chemical compound. So they're chemically hard to break down. So things like green bananas or raw potatoes. Now these are things you might not really eat a lot of, so they're also a little bit irrelevant, but RS2s are fascinating because if you cook them, you change the structure to the point where they are no longer a resistant starch. So if you took a raw potato and cooked it, it becomes a regular starch and your body can absorb those carbs willy-nilly and that can definitely impact glucose, right? Now, my favorite and probably the coolest that you can hack your way through is a resistant starch 3, RS3, a retrograded starch. Now, a retrograded starch is a starch that has been heated and then cooled and you can eat it cold or now the science shows that you can actually reheat it again as long as it's done under specific guidelines, which I'm going to share later in this video on how to reheat these starches. So for example, rice, you heat it, it's no longer resistant starch. You cool it, it's a resistant starch. You can even reheat it after it's been cooled and you will still have it be a resistant starch. Now, we're gonna get into the inner workings of that. I wanna explain that more. I don't wanna to get too scientific on this, but you clicked on this video because you wanna hear about how it impacts insulin resistance and visceral fat, right? First off, from a visceral fat perspective, let's hit on this first. There's a study that was published in Critical Reviews in Food Science. This particular study was rodent model, but they gave rodents uh, regular food and then they gave them regular food plus resistant starch. The resistant starch group ended up having an eight to 45% reduction in total fat mass, of which a large percentage was visceral fat. Now, does this translate directly into humans? Yes, we've seen strong evidence in weight loss, in satiety, in GLP-1 receptor, um, or GL GLP-1s, excuse me, having a huge impact on satiety and ultimate insulin function and how the insulin levels kind of come down. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrition that was really fascinating because it looked specifically at RS3 starches. So these are the cool ones, the ones we heat, cool, and reheat. These RS3 starches, they found compared to, so in this case, they took uh, rice that had been heated, cooled, and heated again, compared to uh, corn that had just been heated, okay? So two similar starches in many ways. What they found is that the rice, the retrograded starch, this RS3, signaled significant amounts, created significant amounts of what's called propionate, which is a short chain fatty acid that's produced by the microbiome. So because it didn't digest in the actual small intestine, it made it to the large intestine, got fed on by bacteria and cross-fed and broke down into this thing called an SCFA, a short chain fatty acid. This signaled some crazy things. These short chain fatty acids like propionate actually regulate fat storage. 
So it regulated the amount of fat that could soak into a fat cell itself. It regulated this at many different levels. There was also an increase in what's called intestinal gluconeogenesis, which is a very energy demanding process, but also makes it so that we store less fat. Now, if we come back to that rodent model study, there are some interesting things that they saw that we can now translate. They found that these mice ended up having a better regulation of fat storage when the resistant starch was there. So their body just didn't like just store fat extra. Like it actually was regulated better. And this could have been because the insulinemia was reduced. The overall levels of insulin were reduced, but also there was a massive increase in GLP-1. Now we are familiar with GLP-1s now because Ozempic is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, right? So now we're seeing like, okay, resistant starches actually increase the amount of GLP-1 that we produce. Now, I've talked about different foods that have resistant starches. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. That's a 30% off discount link. The reason I mentioned is they have things like green banana flour. They have baked goods that are made with resistant starches. They have this kind of stuff. That's why I partner with them on a lot of videos because it makes sense. Like the things I talk about are relevant to what they have on their shelves. So that 30% off discount link gets you 30% off and a free $60 gift. So you get your entire grocery order at 30% off. And you can go in there and you can search for things with like chickpea flour or green banana flour or all these other kind of resistant starches. And I'm gonna mention a few in a little bit. I'm gonna list off some of my favorites and also some tips on how to cook them properly. So I highly recommend that you check out Thrive Market. It's not like going to your regular grocery store. It is worth it. It's worth checking out what they have and it's worth checking out getting 30% off your grocery order. So that link's in the top line of the description underneath this video. Quick recap on insulin resistance though. There was a 31 study, randomized controlled trial study with 900 participants that was published in Frontiers in Nutrition. They gave various kinds of RS1, RS2, and in certain degree RS3 starches. They found both RS1 and RS2 starches overall reduced glucose levels significantly after a meal, postprandially. Okay, but RS2 only lowered insulin levels, which tells us that they are not just working on mechanical digestion, they're working on different pathways. Same with RS3. RS3 has similar uh, benefits in the body than RS2 would. It's just easier to get in my opinion. So what we're seeing here is that not only are we getting slowed digestion that could help us out with glucose, but we're actually having changes in insulin changes in our actual insulin levels that can potentially restore pancreatic beta cell function. This is phenomenal and could be something that could, like by just adding a heated and cooled potato into your diet instead of that regular potato, you could have a monumental impact on your insulin resistance. And people will be so quick to dismiss this and say, oh, this is just some hack, just eat less, move more, yada, yada, eat whatever you want. BS, man, like this stuff works. It's like adding fiber in that doesn't taste like fiber. You're not having to choke down a bunch of like weird chicory root or something. You're actually just choking down potatoes that are just reheated because you had them last night and now you want to have them again. It's pretty awesome. So here's a few of my favorite foods to consume when it comes down to resistant starches. Obviously these are all heated and cooled and I'll give you the process, okay? Heated and cooled potatoes, heated and cooled rice, and also these can be reheated, okay? Heated and cooled beans, Heated and cooled peas is a really big one. You wanna know a cool hack? Heated and cooled brown rice, because when you heat and cool brown rice, you don't just get the RS3 from the heating and recooling, or heating and cooling, but you also get the already existing resistant starch too that's in the shell. Double whammy, super awesome. Heated and cooled pasta, like lentil pasta, legume pasta, you could literally heat it, cool it, and then reheat it again. Tortillas, awesome. Okay, you could cook a tortilla, cool it, and then simply warm it at a slower rate, and you have a resistant starch. Combine that with beans, like think about it. Beans, rice, you could make a resistant starch burrito that has way less impact than a regular burrito. Sweet potatoes are obviously a great one. They're already resistant starch to begin with, and then they become retrograded even more. So that's a great one to add in. And another one you can do is oats. I'm just not a, personally not a big oat fan. So that's another one that you could simply do. Now here's the rules. You can cook them and heat them. You need to cool them for 12 to 24 hours. Okay, the longer the better. You can eat it cold and have a great effect, but if you reheat it, you need to make sure you do a few things. Reheat it at a low temperature. Set your microwave to a lower temperature, okay? Low to medium. Cook it in short intervals, 15 to 20 to 30 seconds at a time. Pull it out, let it chill for a second, do it again, okay? This is really, really important. 
Also, if you add moisture to it, it protects it a little bit. It doesn't dry out and change the structure. So that's an important one. The cool thing is, the more that you heat it, cool it, heat it, cool it, the more changes and actual like realigning and restructuring of the molecules it has. So it becomes more of a resistant starch each time you heat it and cool it, which makes it phenomenally interesting. This is one of the biggest hacks that just is not talked about because it comes across cheesy. Oh, I just reheat my potato. We're not saying this is gonna reverse anything, but holy cow, if you have to like eat a potato, why would you not just meal prep potatoes, cook them, put them in the fridge for 24 hours, and then just reheat them each day, and you're lessening the glycemic load of these, index of these things significantly and having a huge microbiome benefit. So as always, keep it locked to hear my channel. See you tomorrow.